Hello everyone, this week on We Talk Nerdy, I've got the tech news of the week, an email about not updating your Android device, and it's time for part three of my series on the Raspberry Pi, so stay tuned. We Talk Nerdy. We Talk Nerdy.tv is sponsored by UBU Enterprises, specializing in custom business website design, social media marketing, and online branding strategies for companies and products. Comedy Central has canceled the latest incarnation of Futurama. If you're not too familiar with the show, Wikipedia writes, the series follows the adventures of a late 20th century New York City pizza delivery boy by the name of Philip J. Fry, who after being unwitting, unwittingly cryogenically frozen for a thousand years, finds employment at a company called Planet Express, an interplanetary delivery company in a retro futuristic 31st century. The series was envisioned by Matt Groening, creator of The Simpsons in the late 1990s. Futurama debuted on the Fox network back in 1999, and not to put, not to put too fine a point on it, Fox really screwed this show over royally. They originally aired it after The Simpsons so it could develop a following, which it did, and then the geniuses over at Fox moved it uh, to 7 p.m. on Sunday night. And more often than not, the show would be preempted by football, and in an era before DVRs were commonplace, the show lost its audience, withered, and died. Futurama was canceled in 2003 in spite of the fact that, in my humble opinion, it was one of the smartest and funniest shows on network television. Then, miraculously, Comedy Central picked up the show in 2009, and it's been airing new episodes ever since. I still love the characters, but if I'm completely honest, Futurama just isn't as strong as it used to be. I can't say that I'm surprised at its cancellation. The final episode will air on June 19th, or sorry, the final season will start on June 19th with the final episode to air on September 4th. Also in tech news this week, the internet cybersecurity bill known as CISPA was passed by the House and a handful of websites went black earlier this week in protest. Thursday, the Senate under threat of veto from President Obama killed the measure in committee. The bill was opposed by good guys like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the ACLU. Electronic Frontier Foundation lawyer Kurt Opshaw said, the bill sacrifices online privacy while failing to take common sense steps to improve security. The measure was supported by internet heavyweights like Microsoft, Facebook, and Apple, presumably because the bill would have granted those companies uh, that share information related to online threats immunity from liability. Apparently, immunity from liability trumps privacy for these companies. Thanks, Apple, Microsoft, and Facebook. You really know how to, well, betray your customers, don't you? Uh, also, Geek.com has the story of a clever Swedish research team led by a man named Aman Rusum uh, that has hacked an inexpensive DVD player and turned it into a lab on a DVD. According to the story, flow cytometry, a standard practice in HIV testing, involves the counting and organization of cells. The standard practice, sorry, Though standard, through standard practice, a flow cytometry machine is still quite expensive, sometimes reaching up to $30,000. Means that developing countries or underfunded practices may not be able to afford one. However, a cheap DVD player is eminently more affordable, and the lab on DVD is estimated to cost as little as $200. This is the kind of life-changing technology that makes me proud to be a fellow hacker. This story goes to show how systems that are open and modifiable can lead to greater innovation, innovation than ones that are closed and proprietary. I strongly believe that putting tech into the hands of people who are able to turn it to novel uses can make the world a better place. Speaking of hacking, stay tuned for part three of my series on the Raspberry Pi. Today I'm gonna to show you how to connect to and control a circuit with the, with the Pi. But first, I've got an email this week from Tom R. who writes, I watched your Android, Android rooting episode with interest. 
In it, you talked about over-the-air updates. I don't want to update. Is there a way to stop that annoying pop-up? Hi, Tom, and thanks for your email. I'm assuming that this is the pop-up you're referring to. When an over-the-air update is available, Android will remind you about every 30 minutes or so that you need to do apply the update. If you, aren't all, if you aren't ready to update for whatever reason, it can be pretty annoying. And yes, there is a way to stop it. However, uh, the technique requires your device to be rooted. But since you don't want to apply the update, I'm assuming that your device is rooted. That's the only reason I can think of for not applying the update right away. Uh, I had this happen to me not too long ago. I was in Europe and just as I, or sorry, I was in America going to Europe and just as I was leaving the country, an OTA update arrived on my phone, which is super annoying. Since my phone is rooted, I knew that applying the update wasn't going to work and I didn't really want to fool around with it while I was on vacation. So I was able to turn off the annoying reminders using an app called Root Browser Lite. There are a number of apps in the Google Play Store that allow you to view and make changes to the Android file system, but Root Browser Lite is free and easy to use. Now, a word of warning here, programs like Root Browser Lite will allow you to make changes to your Android device that could result in your device becoming totally inoperable. So use common sense and don't delete any system files that uh, you might need. <laughs> Um, so here's how I did it. Um, using root browser light, I navigated to system slash etc slash security. In that folder is a file called otacerts.zip. I renamed the file to otacerts.back, then I rebooted my device. After that, the pop-up stopped nagging me uh, and everything was fine. Uh, now, I've read online that this uh, hack can negatively impact your battery life. I haven't found that to be the case on my Galaxy Nexus, um, but I suppose it is possible. Uh, Android is constantly changing, so if this technique doesn't work for you for whatever reason, I suggest you point your browser to the XDA Developers Forum at the URL right here and do a search or post a request for help with your particular device. Thanks for the email, Tom. And remember folks, if you have a question, a comment, or you just wanna talk nerdy, you can visit wetalknerdy.tv and leave a comment or email us here at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Now, I'd like to do a little self-promotion here, if I may. If you're a fan of we Talk Nerdy TV, and you'd like to help me pay the bills and get some great swag in the process, please visit our shop where you can order cool wetalknerdy.tv stuff, everything from t-shirts and hoodies to pins, bumper stickers, and coffee mugs. There are hundreds of items available, and each can be customized in a multitude of colors and sizes, and you'd be doing me a great favor, and I would be most grateful. And now it's time for part three of my series on the Raspberry Pi. Today, I'm going to show you how to control an LED with the Pi. And now I realize that this is not an amazing project or anything, but remember the Raspberry Pi was developed as an educational platform. This example project is a good first step that nearly anyone can do. Even if you have no interest in electronics or programming, I'm hoping that you will find this enlightening. Uh, when you see how easy this is, perhaps you'll be inspired to try a project of your own. Now, to begin, we need our Raspberry Pi all set up and ready to go as I explained in part two of this series. I'm going to proceed based on the assumption that you've already installed Raspbian and Wheezy on your Pi. Now, naturally, you're going to need an LED uh, a, some wire, uh, a resistor, and a soldering iron and or a breadboard uh, for making the circuit. A breadboard, like the one I have here, is a simple and inexpensive tool for creating, testing, and prototyping circuits. You can purchase all of these parts, including the breadboard, 
uh, for just a few dollars at a store like Radio Shack or from an online retailer. If you don't have a breadboard, you can solder the wires together or even just connect them, twist them together and connect them with tape. In this example, I'm going to use this breadboard uh, because it makes things really easy. Now, if you've never used a breadboard before, the horizontal holes are connected together on either side of a central dividing line, while the holes on the far left and right are connected vertically. This is for powering the circuit and it's called a bus strip. Making a circuit is as simple as pushing a wire into the appropriate hole. Now, step one is to take a look at the Raspberry Pi and identify what are called the GPIO pins. The GPIO stands for General Purpose Input Output. These pins are what we can use to get input from other devices, like thermal sensors, for example, and we can use them to switch on and off our LED. There are two sets of 13 pins, 26 pins in all. With the SD card at the top and the USB connector at the bottom, as you look down on the Pi, the odd numbered pins are on the left and the even numbered pins are on the right. This pin diagram comes courtesy of Matt from the Raspberry Pi Spy website. Unfortunately, the pins are organized in a somewhat confusing fashion. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to refer to the pins by number. For this example, we're going to be using pins 9, 11, and 17. Now, if you have an old IDE cable around, you could connect that to the pins. Um, but in order to make things as obvious as possible, I went ahead and I soldered uh, little wires to those pins. That way you can see exactly which pins are connected to what part of the breadboard. Normally, uh, you would want to use different colored wires, but since I only had green wire, I taped little labels to each wire so I wouldn't get them confused. This is important because if you connect the wrong wires together, you could short out and possibly ruin your Raspberry Pi. You obviously don't want to do that. Now, before we try to write a program to turn on the LED, I want to start by setting up a test circuit. My goal here is to wire up an LED directly to the Raspberry Pi and make sure that it comes on. That way, once I write my program to make the LED blink, I'll know that the circuit is working ahead of time. Once I've got that working properly, I'll move on to the next step. When we look at our pin diagram, I can see that pin nine is our ground wire. If it helps, you can think of that as minus. And pin 17 is our plus three volt wire. To start, I'm going to connect those wires to the breadboard and see if I can get the LED to glow. But I have a slight problem. My LED runs off of 2.1 volts, not 3.3, which is what the Raspberry Pi produces. So in order to reduce the voltage, I'm going to use a small resistor. A resistor, like the name implies, resists the flow of electricity. Resistance is measured in ohms, and the resistor I have here is a 470 ohm resistor, which is actually a little bit too much, but for the sake of this project, it'll work just fine. All you really need to know is that it's important to use a resistor with each LED in your circuit. You can use anything from 100 ohms to 470 ohms, and it should work just fine. Uh, again, you can get resistors at Radio Shack or some other online retailer. Okay, moving on. So all I have to do is plug the wires into the breadboard, and when I turn on the Raspberry Pi, the LED should start to glow. If it doesn't, you might have the LED in backwards. Unlike the resistor, the LED needs to be hooked up the right way around, otherwise it won't work. So if I turn it around and then it glows, I know I had it in backwards. So now we have a working circuit. This is great, but we wanna be able to control the LED, not just have it come on whenever we turn on the Pi. So I, we need to change this circuit slightly. Instead of connecting the LED to pins nine and 17, we wanna connect it to pins nine and 11. 
pin 11 is the pin that we're going to program to come on and off. So I'm going to unhook 17 and put 11 in its place. Now when I turn on the Raspberry Pi, the LED does not come on right away. So now we can write a program in Python to turn it on. Now Python is a powerful programming language and it's included with the Raspberry Pi. Before we can write that program though, we need to install some Python development software. Don't worry, it's really easy. And I'll show you exactly how to do it. Start up your Raspberry Pi, open a terminal window and type sudo apt-get install python-dev. Now, let me explain what this does. sudo means run the next command as superuser. su for superuser and do as in do this, sudo. apt is a program called the advanced packaging tool and you're telling it to get some software and install it. In this case, we wanna get the Python development tools. APT is smart enough to know what to do. All you have to do is tell it what you want. And of course, you have to be connected to the internet for APT to be able to find and download the software for you. Once you have installed the Python developer tools, you need to get your hands on the Raspberry Pi GPIO library. This is just extra software that Python needs in order to be able to make use of the GPIO pins. There's no package for this. You need to download it and install it manually. But again, this is really simple. Here's what you do. Simply start up Midori, which is the Raspberry Pi web browser. You should find a link to it uh, right next to the start, but where the start button would be if this was Windows, but on Linux, it's in the lower left-hand corner. There's a little button that starts up Midori. You can also start it from the terminal window if you choose and uh, go to this URL. Click the green button to download the library. Midori will download a file called rpi.gpio. There's some numbers, it's a version number, and the file ends in .tar.gz. Now, by the way, this is called a tarball, and it's the Linux equivalent of a zip file. Uh, and just like a zip file, you need to be able to extract the contents in order to be able to use them. You can use a terminal window or you can use the file browser. Either way, once you have extracted the files from the tarball, use this command, sudo python setup.py install. This command tells Python to install the library files. We're almost there. Now we're ready to program. I'm a novice Python programmer myself, so I have a program here written by Rahul Carr from the Raspberry Pi blog. It makes the LED blink 50 times. It's a really simple program. It's only 17 lines. So let's take a quick look at it and see what it does. The first two lines import modules that we need in order to make the program work. Lines three through nine define a function called blink. Line five sets the GPIO pin to high. In other words, turns on the current. Line six tells the program to sleep for one second. Then line seven sets the GPIO pin to low, which turns off the current. And then line eight makes the program sleep again for one second. So the blink function turns the LED on, waits, turns it off, and then waits again. Really simple. At the bottom of the program, there's a loop function. Line 15 through 16 says to Python to blink the pin 50 times. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Let me show you how to copy this program and run it on your Raspberry Pi. First, you're gonna to wanna to open a ter terminal window on your Pi and then type sudo nano blink50.py. Again, sudo runs a program called nano as a super user. Nano is a text editing program that we can use to save our Python uh, script. Next, uh, you want to copy the program from either my show notes on the We Talk Nerdy TV website 
or you can copy it from the Raspberry Pi blog. Once you've done that, right click in the terminal window and choose Paste from the pop-up menu. This should paste a copy of the program into Nano. If you want, you can mess around with editing it in Nano as well, but for this first run through, just leave it the way it is and go ahead and press Control X to exit and then press Y to save the program as blink50.py. If you type ls in the terminal window, you should now see a file called blink50.py in your directory. Now, you're all set to go. All you have to do is run the program. And in order to do that, you're gonna type sudo python blink50.py. That will run the, or run the script that we just created with Nano. And if all goes well, the LED attached to your Raspberry Pi should blink 50 times and then stop. Now, this is a great time to experiment. You can try changing the program to make the LED blink faster or slower. Don't be afraid to mess around with it. 50 is kind of a lot of numbers of loops. It's gonna take uh, almost two minutes to go through that cycle. So you might wanna make it say 10 uh, blinks instead of 50. Well, congratulations. You've completed your first Raspberry Pi project. As I said at the outset, this is a simple example uh, for beginners. Blinking in LED is not an earth shattering project, but this is really just meant to open your eyes and help you get started. From here, for example, you could replace the LED uh, and then you could use a uh, small uh, electronic module called a relay. And then you could use the Pi to turn on and off, uh, say, other devices at certain times of the day. Or you can learn about how to receive input from other modules. Um, like, for example, uh, you could turn on and off some device based on temperature. There's a lot more you can do with the Raspberry Pi, and I've given you some, some links to other examples in show notes before, um, so check on those. And I hope I've got you started with your Raspberry Pi, and hopefully I'm sending you off in a good direction. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Next week, I wanna show you how to replace the battery on a iPhone. I hope you'll tune in for that. And remember, if you have questions or problems and you need answers, visit us at wetalknerdy.tv and leave a comment in the comment section or send us an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Thanks again for watching. And we'll see you next Monday. This is so nice, sir.